If you know one thing about shiny hunting in Pokemon Emerald, it's that hunting this way is wrong and will not work. You may have heard this before, but Emerald's random number generator is broken, so soft resetting doesn't work ever. Then why was I hunting this way? Well, it's because I fixed the broken RNG with the Nintendo e-reader. This is something that I've dreamed about ever since I returned e-reader functionality to Pokemon Emerald for the events that I made a few years ago. So how exactly is the RNG broken, and what consequences does that have for players? RNG is the luck in the game. It's a number that the game looks at when it needs to make something random happen, like generate a Pokemon. Now, it wouldn't be very random if the same number was used for everything, right? Well, it's not. The way this works is that the game uses the date and time kept by the real-time clock that Emerald has, and it converts it into a number. We'll call this the initial seed. The initial seed can range from 0 to 65,535, and then it loops back around to 0 after it reaches the maximum. The date and time is kept up to the minute. So in effect, your starting number changes around every minute or so. Then, every 16.67 milliseconds, the game changes what the current number is by multiplying it by 1,103,515,245. Then, it adds 24,691 to it. 16.67 milliseconds is the time it takes to render the GBA screen once. So the game's luck changes every video frame. Or, well, that's how Emerald's RNG is supposed to work. This is how it works in Ruby and Sapphire. Game Freak accidentally removed the code for the initial seed in Emerald, so it never pulls any data from the real-time clock, or from anywhere for that matter. Its starting point is always zero. The RNG is still advanced every frame, though. This method is actually good enough that even with the same starting position every time, most people would never notice this glitch. This is because if you play for an extended period of time, you'll experience so many different current random numbers that you'll never really see a repeat pattern. However, if you are constantly resetting the game in the hopes of a specific outcome, you'll quickly notice that, hey, I've seen that Totodile before. Or, man, that NPC always turns left when I load in. And Pokemon players are constantly doing this. They'll do it thousands and thousands of times. Why? Well, to get a different colored alligator. This makes it very difficult to shiny hunt some pretty popular Pokemon. Not only that, but if you wanted to reset normally for a Pokemon with good stats, maybe for the Battle Frontier, that also is broken by this glitch. These activities are so popular that there have actually been multiple RNG fix patches over the years. However, those are ROM hacks, which the e-reader is not. A ROM hack is directly editing the code of the game. You'd have to play this on emulator or with a flashcard or something. The e-reader only adds data to your existing save file. It might seem like I'm being pedantic about this, but it drastically changes how difficult it is to fix the RNG, and the scope of the problem becomes almost too big to solve. To understand why this is so much harder to solve, let's look at what the e-reader does at a very basic level. 1. It sends data during the link-up between it and Emerald. 2. It specifies an NPC to run a custom event script. And then 3. When speaking to said NPC, they run my event script instead of their usual one. This means I only have control over the game when I'm either sending an e-card or directly after you talk to the NPC that I chose to assign my script to. But RNG seeding is supposed to happen at game launch. Because my conditions for control are so limited, any solution where you talk to an NPC to change your seed would be kind of clunky. What, am I gonna talk to this guy and then run to Kyogre every time? No. So is there anything that will let me control the game from boot? Well, there is but we're going to have to delve into the dark realm of glitches to understand it. We'll be taking advantage of a trick called Arbitrary Code Execution, abbreviated as ACE. ACE in Emerald typically works like this. You look at a glitch Pokemon, its animation plays, and that animation is glitched and references your Pokemon box names, which you can then run as code. This lets you write small programs to do some pretty useful stuff. But there's actually several different ways to do Ace. You don't have to use a glitch Pokémon all the time. And today we'll be looking at the most obscure entry point of them all. The Glitch Object Event Movement Type. An object event is basically Emerald's term for a NPC. It can be a person, a cut tree, a rock smash rock, a strength boulder, an item on the ground, a static Pokémon, and more I'm probably forgetting. All object events have what is called a movement type. This mostly determines how they walk around on a map. Are they running in a circle, looking around randomly, mirroring your moves, etc. But weirdly, the player character is also using one of these called movement type player. They're not really different from an NPC. 
The code for these movement types run every frame when the game loads in. And lucky for us, there's a glitched type of them. Movement type 6E points to our Pokemon storage system in box 12, slots 13 through 17. That means if I've got code there, when the game boots, I can randomize the number because this runs every frame when I load the map. However, when you use Ace, aka as a glitch, you just give up four PC boxes to bad eggs or other Pokemon who sneakily have code inside of them. Like this guy, the Registry Saver Metapod. He's my favorite. But I really didn't like this. The whole point of using e-cards the way that I do is to create a seamless experience. It should feel identical to the regular game state, and having the user lose four box spaces while also seeing bad eggs, which are kind of scary, just felt wrong. I've actually known about this idea for several years, ever since I read about it on Bonziri's blog, but the bad egg thing was too off-putting, so I shelved the idea. Until one day, when I was talking with Merp, a ROM hacker, Tasser, and all-around cool person. She was showing me a custom Mew event that she made for Fire Red, similar to the stuff that I did with the e-reader. In it was a code that she ran every frame to shorten Mew's nickname length. What the heck? It runs every frame? The way this works is genius. All credit to Merp for finding it. You see, when the screen is done being drawn, it enters a state called V-blank. When the game gets to V-Blank, it jumps to a special function called the Vertical Blank Interrupt. It doesn't really matter what the V-Blank Interrupt does. But what does matter is the way the game runs this every frame is by storing the location of that function in RAM. This means that I can change that location to whatever I want, including my own code. Now surely whatever V-Blank Interrupt was doing was important, considering they run this every single frame, right? So won't overwriting it be a problem? Well, no, and that's because we can actually end whatever custom code we put there by saying, hey, after you're done here, go to vBlank Interrupt. And it works like a charm. So this has to be it, right? The holy grail. Full, permanent control with no glitchy side effects. Unfortunately, no. This does not persist across a save. So yes, we can get full control of the game to do whatever we want, every frame, but the moment we turn it off, we're done. However, if we combine both forms of persistence here, we can get the perfect solution. Buckle up, the solution here is pretty insane. Scanning the card is my first entry point. While the e-card is transferring, it's going to send scripting language stuff to the game in its dedicated section. This is called RAM script. I have no control over that. But Game Freak also has a small scripting language section that I can use while the transfer happens and this is called the preload script. For the Eon ticket, they use this to check if you've already received it. I'll be using the preload script to call an assembly program that I wrote to store a bunch of code and other data in an unused section of the flash memory chip, which is where the game saves to. Now, after you scan the card, you have to talk to this aide in Professor Birch's lab, and that's my second entry point. He will ask you if you want to patch your game. If you say yes, I run a small assembly program that sets up the vBlink interrupt persistence. I won't cover this one in much detail because it's not important. Just know that what it's doing is setting it up so that the initial control is there. Anyway, once the vBlink interrupt persistence is running, every single frame I'm doing two things. The first thing I do is I set your movement type to the glitch type. This doesn't actually take effect until the map loads, but if the map is ever loading, I also unset your movement type really quickly so the game doesn't crash because my code isn't there yet. The reason I'm doing this is because when you save, the glitch movement type will be set into the save file so that it can then be called on load. And if the map is constantly resetting it, I can't, I won't have any control. So I need to be doing this all the time. The other thing I do is check if you're saving the game. And if you are, that's when I take control. The game actually keeps track of how many times you've saved. So what I do is when I first get control, I take that number and I copy it somewhere else. And then I'm constantly comparing to see if the original number is changing, the one that the game updates manually. And if it has, that's how I gain access. So before the save finishes, I hijack it and I copy all the Pokemon from box 12, slots 13 through 17 to the unused save sector that I also stored my code in. Then from that sector, I copy and paste all the code that glitch movement type needs to function into those box slots. They would look like bad eggs if you could see them. 
Now there were two minor problems with this. The first was that VBlank Interrupt continues to run while saving. The game really didn't like this, so I had to set up a timer in my program after the first success state to pause me messing with the flash memory chip. And then the second problem was that after you save, the bad eggs will be in the PC. So if you save again, wouldn't your Pokemon be deleted permanently? These were actually both solved in the same way. The start of my code first checks to see if it's in a waiting state, checked against some variable I set once a save happens. I then tuned the timer for the wait state to be around the same length as a save. Once the timer is up, I restore the Pokemon to your PC and turn the timer off. This makes it so that the bad eggs will always be in your PC when a game launches, but never visible to you after you save. That's everything I do while the game is actually running, and you would never notice it if it wasn't for the fact that the music gets played like twice right when you start saving. It's just a little hiccup, but that's it. I know it seems scary that I'm saying your Pokemon are deleted from your boxes and then put somewhere else and I put them back and you just have to trust me that it's going to work, but I've tested this on every possible ASLR position and I've never had any problems and I've tested them on personally my own guys. Now for the other half of the solution the glitched object event movement type. Like I said, when the map loads, this goes right to your PC boxes, where my code now is. So the first thing I do is set the movement type back to normal. After that, I load all of my custom code from an unused save sector. In addition to custom code, we've got the four Pokemon in there and where your seed is. After all the data is loaded, the first thing I do is start the timer for my VBLAG interrupt function. Doing this means that it won't run immediately. It'll be paused for a brief moment, like when you're saving. I'll explain why this is a little bit later. Then I apply my fix to the RNG. I was originally going to try and write a function to use the date and time like Ruby and Sapphire do, but my friend Xiao thought of something that I think is actually even better. We just count up from zero. In the unused save section I loaded, I made sure to keep an empty spot for this seed. Every time a new game loads, I check that spot in memory, add one to it, and use it as the initial seed. Then I resave that unused save sector. This is nice because it doesn't require a working battery, and it means that every reset you will hit a different initial seed, rather than like four or five depending on how long the reset you were doing take. After this is done, I set the vblank interrupt persistent up by changing the pointer and copying my code somewhere else. I can't leave it in this spot for reasons that aren't worth explaining. Then I exit this code state by calling a map loading function that also resets your movement type permanently. The final thing that happens is my timer for the VBlank interrupt runs out and the Pokemon get restored to your PC, the same as if you had just saved. This is actually the only reason I started the pause timer at all. And we're done. Now you can soft reset as God intended in Pokemon Emerald. After the patch is applied, if you speak to the NPC who initiated this fix a second time, he'll tell you what the initial seed was and he'll let you turn the patch off if you would like to. Now, I did my best to cover my bases to make sure this would not interfere with any typical gameplay, but I am not sure this hack is very persistent. I'm confident it'll work in like 99.9% .9 of your typical gameplay scenarios, but I'm sure there's something I screwed up and a reason you would need to turn this off. The only scenario I am 100% sure of where you have to turn it off is when you're loading a different event. All Wonder Cards and official eCards use RAM script, so please turn it off if you receive one of those. In addition to this, the sequence does remember what seed you're on after you turn it off. So there's no harm in turning the function on, shiny hunting for a Pokemon, and then turning it off until you need to do your next hunt. I guess what I'm saying is, use this at your own risk, even though I tried my best to do due diligence. After I post this video, I'll be doing my first ever shiny hunt for my favorite Pokemon, Totodile, and I'll live stream it right on this channel, so tune in for that. If you ever use this patch to hunt, please tag me on Blue Sky or Discord. I'd love to see people using this patch. In addition, if you're unsure how to get this event into your game or you don't have an e-reader to use, check out this video I made on the very topic. It covers how to get mystery event unlocked into Emerald and how to put any of my events, including this e-card, into your game without any issues or e-reader at all. You don't have to print a card out to do this, right? Lastly, I know many people would like to just shiny hunt the Hoenn starters normally. So I'll provide an emerald save with the patch pre-installed and ready to hunt. All you have to do is open the save in PK Hex to edit the trainer name, trainer gender, and OTID, and hunt away. I think that's it. Happy hunting, and 
Enjoy your fixed copy of Emerald.